Irisa, thanks so much for joining the show today. To get started, can you tell the audience a little bit about your background and history in UX design? Hi, I'm Risa. I'm Japanese, and now I'm based in LA. Uh, in terms of design background, I didn't graduate design schools, so I learned how to product design um, through internships. So while in school, I, since I was a freshman, I think I took a lot of internship opportunities and. The first company I joined was Yahoo Japan. As I mentioned, I'm Japanese. I, I came to America two years ago. So my experience in tech is mostly in Japan. After Yahoo, I joined several startups. So I'm deep in the startup world. Uh, most recently, I joined Netflix. So it's a little bit different in terms of size and scale. But I've been doing this more, more than six years now. And I'm in love with this industry and the world of product design. Nice. Love to hear that. I think <laughs> something that's interesting, you mentioned startups and then you mentioned Netflix, which was a startup a long time ago, but now is, is a giant company. What's the difference for designers working at maybe in mindset of working at like, you know, I don't know how big the startups you're at are, but going from a startup to an enterprise company, how do, how do you think about that? I think the biggest difference between big company versus startup is the the amount of variety of work you you need to do so when i joined yahoo i thought i was doing like product design but actually i was only doing ui design mm -hmm. and i didn't really realize that until i left yahoo japan because after yahoo japan i joined a company of five people and i was the only designer there so I, I had to do everything. So not just UI, but UX and user research, uh, marketing, branding, uh, just even uh, coming up with a product. Uh, when I joined, we didn't have a product. So I had to partner up with the CEO to really bring his vision to life. So it was a lot of the things that I didn't do at a big company because there was someone else doing it for me. How was collaboration driven between um, what I imagine to be a pretty large design team? Yeah, so I think the first uh, what the first thing we need to do to understand each other is like what is our role. Uh, so uh, this is my first time collaborating with design ops, and right. for me, I didn't know when to include them because. Um, I'm used to, you know, setting workshops and thinking about collaboration as a designer. I always thought that's like a part of designer's role. It's designing partnership is a part of designer's role. Improving design process is a designer's role. But uh, Netflix, um, design ops will help us through that initiative. So um, one of the things I love what they did for me was that they set up a one-on-one -on -one with me and they literally like <laughs> showed me their job description and they're like okay this is why i'm here these are the things i've done in the past and i was like oh okay so i'm not alone i can like depend on them when i'm doing these uh, going through these uh struggles so first of all like understanding why we're here and how we can help each other i think is the number one thing um, same for content designers. Um, I've never worked with them before, but yeah. they have like a whole deck talking about, we're just, we're not copywriters. We're here to design the voice of the product. So that was really interesting. Risa, one of the things that that's interesting, uh, cause you're, cause you're at Netflix, which is something that I think is a great product at telling stories, but you're also interested in becoming a better storyteller yourself and think that's an effective medium for designers. Tell me about that. How, how should designers use storytelling effectively? I think one of the things I've struggled a lot was I have great, oh, well, I thought, I think I have great ideas, but sometimes I struggle to convince the room to listen to me, or I, at least I felt that way. And so I was like, why isn't people listening to me? <laughs> there was so many situations where I would like say something, right? And then they, the conversation just goes on. And then the next meeting, a week after that, somebody says, the, in my mind, the exact same thing. And then people listen. So I was yeah. like, what is happening here? So 
I think I, I think there's some research done where like what you say is 20%, what you how you say is 80%. So I think as a designer to become truly impactful, you need to be a good storyteller. And one of the things I I noticed right off the bat after joining Netflix is how great everybody is at storytelling. I think because of the nature of Netflix, like everybody really values storytelling. And so, yeah, I've been learning a lot. Like, for example, I've hosted a workshop around team gratitude because uh, we found out that some folks were burnt out. So we were like, okay, let's set this team gratitude workshop. And if it was me before, I would have just then, you know, started that and then like made people awkwardly post post it to one another but what I did differently was I set up the stage like it, it I spent like five minutes talking about why it's important to gratitude for us to you know thank thank each other what's the emotional impact we have through gratitude and also like showed some like roadmap in our um, initiative in terms of like how we want to continue to uh, work on team collaboration and gratitude. You're also uh, getting into mentorship, which I think is awesome, right? There's there's tons of resources for that. Um, and obviously, you know, a lot of designers I see want to want to help out new entrants in the field. Uh, Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I started Mentor about two years ago. And the reason why I started it was because a couple of reasons. One was because I was at a startup and I didn't have anybody uh, to mentor within the company. So I wanted to grow that part of skill, right? Like mentoring and coaching. So I signed up for ADP List where I get to mentor people from all over the world. So that was one reason. And then the second reason is because when I was in Japan and I had a dream of working in the United States, I didn't really have a role model. So Mm -hmm. I wanted to be more proactive in the design community so that folks who are are struggling with the same challenges can get some guidance. Uh, So I started a YouTube channel where I could share, you know, contents around whiteboard challenge and actually share my screen and walk through um, how I approach whiteboard challenges. And if you want to check out my YouTube channel, it's Risa Pizza and I talk about product and tech. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's a great way of, you know, sharing the knowledge beyond just one-on-ones and um, yeah, a lot of those questions are going to be the same for new entrants in the field. So that's a great idea. So Risa, I know you moved from Japan to the U.S. How, how is Japanese design, which I think a lot of us look up to, kind of different or inspiring how you're designing these days? I think Japan is interesting because when you think of like historical culture, it's very like focused on minimalism, right? So in Japan, um, there's a culture of I don't trust this product if it doesn't have information like they associate trust with the amount of information so when i was designing a yahoo transit app which is equivalent of google map in japan uh it looked like a dictionary um overwhelming text but as i did some user interviews they were like oh no like this is okay i want to see everything in one screen and they were like, I need to know the time. I need to know the the the, uh, the crowdiness. Like, I need to know everything. So that's why it ended up being like a, such a dense dense screen. And you could say the same thing for landscape too. If you go to Shibuya, the center of Tokyo, if you look at the city, you see all these ads, like overwhelming <laughs> ads, uh, on the building, like windows, and it's very different culture. And I think there's two reasons. One is that Japan is dense, like there's a lot of people living in yeah. such a small place, so they're used to the density. And then the second thing I think is that they associate density with trust. So uh, it's really interesting to know how culture affects UI pro- and products, and especially when you're designing for a global audience. 
uh, like Netflix, um, it's really important to be considerate of that, it, of that because, you know, when you're onboarding a user to the product and yeah. making them log in, like maybe the amount of information we need to show differs from U.S. audience and Japanese audience. I love that. That's fascinating. And Risa, thanks so much for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I love talking to people in you know, our industry and sharing whatever that might be interesting for folks. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on.